Hello and welcome. Today I'm talking about our entanglement with nature, the partnership with the biomaterial, and about how knowing, acting, and caring come together in transformative practice. Here you can see me, six years old, with my dad on the beach, collecting flotsam that he would then collect in our filling basement uh, to make sculptures from. And on the right side, you see me last year, 40 years later, collecting algae in Iceland. I haven't come that far, I think. Somehow, since childhood, I've always felt very connected to nature. If I looked at sci-fi movies, I was thinking, where are all the others? And this entanglement with nature became the main topic of my work. This understanding of when we feel connected to, when we feel a part of nature, and when we become so much different. In 2007, I was an artist in residence in Japan. I wanted to look at man and marine life and how we use the sea to sustain ourselves, and I fell in love with seaweed. When I encountered it on the fish market, immediately I saw the le leather. I had worked with leather before, and this transformation from animal to material to matter to object, and the ethics shifts that occur in this transformation. And here I saw this leather-like material that grew up to six meters long and 30 centimeters wide in just one year, cleaning the ocean, uh, creating a habitat for other species while doing so. A leather without any of the chemicals, without any of the labor, labor processes that we could grow in ways that actually enhance the ecosystem. I became completely hooked. And I took 10 kilos back to Europe, trying to figure out what to do with this stuff how to really turn it into this material that I imagined. I found partners here. Sadly, the kind of brown kelp I love to work with doesn't grow in the Baltic. But this is a sea farm on the west coast of Sweden, um, near Kristineberg Marine Station, um, where you actually hang the seaweed into the sea from the top, and it grows and creates a habitat for fish and crustaceans where there might be a sandy sea bottom on which not much other things can grow. It's fascinating how this material can offer not just a resource to us, but also another aspect of how to be in this world. It enables us to think with it into its ecosystem and into many futures that have seaweed as a matter of making. The seaweed carries the ocean within it. When we touch it, we can smell it, it becomes sticky, it transforms completely when the humidity changes in the room. So this idea that there is an organism that actually heals the environment it lives in, even though it is such, you know, it grows so abundantly and so fast, but not at the expense of others, but to their benefit, it really fascinated me. I decided that I need to dedicate a huge chunk of time to develop this vision I had in Japan. And I enrolled in a PhD because of this organism that I found so fascinating. As part of my PhD, I had the chance to have a studio in the Victoria and Albert Museum, an artist residency that was open to the public on two days a week. And I called it the Department of Seaweed to claim that seaweed is as important as other materials that might have or have had their departments in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Textiles, ceramics, glass, silverware. Here it is, the department of seaweed. This is what people saw when they walked in and said, oh, I didn't know there was a department of seaweed. And I said, yes, welcome, come right in. And what was so wonderful is that it was a hypothetical space talking about a potential future, but not showing the future, suggesting, hinting at it, so that people could come up with themse by themselves what we might be building under the umbrella of a really great institution that made it believable. With this community that we founded there, we started building this sculpture, the Okinaga Node, a portrait of seaweedness 
that really took one piece of seaweed in between uh, slices of rattan so that you could actually, it, the seaweed, when it dried, morphed the shapes into these um, s surface structures, basically. Since then, I made a number of installations, some of which were on show here in Finland and worldwide, actually. But the most important outcome was this understanding of us not being able to shift as much as we want to and to create the changes by ourselves. If I imagine seaweed futures, it's quite exciting for myself. You know, there are possible and probable futures, and I can imagine what we could make, but it's still one person projecting into this future. And if it doesn't become a collective effort, if it doesn't become a community of practice, it's not going to resonate enough. So I wrote my PhD on co-speculative design, on this idea of half-creating potential futures that allow people to look from different angles and imagine something, and that enable the dialogue around what kind of seaweed futures we would like to have. So when you work with collectives, there is always so many elements at play, so many people, so many scenarios, and I go into the situation thinking with this framework, what are we knowing? Who is caring here? What path to agency do we have? How are we acting? It's kind of built on this head, heart and hand model that we use in transformational learning, but it's not introspective looking at how I care, but it's kind of trying to figure out in this scenario, who is there? Who are we playing with? Only in the middle, where all three come together, the change can actually happen. If we have a scenario where there is caring and acting present, but not enough knowledge, we have a lot of energy that might be misdirected. We might have activism that alienates those who should be our partners. If we have knowing and acting present, but not a big enough understanding of who to care for and how to engage with a broader audience and uh, other stakeholders, we might have a really powerful situation where a multinational company, for example, can shift a lot, but only cares for their own shareholders and not for future generations. Here, as creatives, we need to think how to build care, whether to bring their children around the table and talk about futures whether to bring long-term thinking or multi-species aspects into the room. And if we have a situation where knowing and caring is present, but no path to action, no acting, then we have this very stagnant situation with eco-anxiety or depression, where all our creative energies should be focused on building agency, finding partners, building collectives. So with this very quick analysis, we can think as creatives what to do, how to connect these different, like how to react in this situation, what to build first, what should be our strategy of engagement. Here, design, or in a broader sense, the creative practitioner becomes the connective tissue between disciplinary knowledges, really trying to bring a changing situation into a preferred one, really trying to enable change. To illustrate this, I want to share with you the experience of Sam Dupont, who is a marine scientist and has been working with the topic of ocean acidification for many decades. He said to me, everyone who reads my papers already knows everything about ocean acidification. How can I reach the broader audience? How can I make my science matter more and have an impact? And then he realized it's not the paper itself. The paper is important, but he needs to reach out to people differently. So he hired a stall at the supermarket furthest away from the coast in Sweden, under the banner, Taste the Future. He cooked the shrimps from his experiments that he had grown in water conditions from 2020, 2030, and 2050. And guess what? The shrimps taste different in the future. So suddenly people said, oh my god, the shrimps will taste different, <laughs> what can I do? And he suddenly had his nature paper published, but also created this funnel to international, national press, 
just before Christmas, when shrimps mattered most, to actually lead people towards that bit of knowledge and make them care. I love this, because I think he was acting as a creative practitioner. This is how a designer would approach this topic, and I love that there, in one person, you have all of these skills together. Sometimes you need a team of people to have all these skills, and I think this is what we have to offer. As creative practitioners, we have an incredible freedom in practices, in modalities, in approaches. And we can kind of use different methods, compile them, and mix them like a DJ almost. So when we are working with others, we don't have to abide by any of the specific rules. We can mi mix and match and find the right approaches to communicate the ideas we're dealing with. Quite often, it's little mindset shifts that we need to shift our behavior. This is an installation I made for the Wellcome Trust, um, and it was on the topic of co-inhabitation in the human body. The majority of our living cells are actually not human. They are other organisms we are co-inhabiting our bodies with. And this was the installation. When you walked on the other side of the road, uh, or went on the bus, you would see these two reclining bodies. But when you looked closely, you would see only the bacterial colonies from our skin, the three most common colonies from each part of the skin, photographed to make this human form. It's a human without the human being present. We are ecosystems, walking within other ecosystems, interacting, if our mindset shifts like this and we realize that we are already multi-species actors on our inside, suddenly it doesn't feel scary anymore. It's the most normal thing for us to be like this. Eco-philosopher David Abrams says, our bodies have formed themselves in delicate reciprocity with the manifold textures, sounds and shapes of an animate earth our eyes have evolved in subtle interaction with other eyes, as our ears are attuned by the very structure to the howling of wolves and the honking of geese. To shut ourselves off from these other voices, to continue by our lifestyles, to condemn these other sensibilities to the oblivion of extinction, is to rob our own senses of their integrity and to rob our minds of their coherence. We are human only in contact and conviviality with what is not human. In a way, this really resonates with how I think this mindset shift needs to happen. And I try to ignite that kind of thinking also in our students that you see here, snorkeling at Tvermene Marine Research Station as part of the course Materials and Living Systems that I run together with Anna van der Leij. These are design students starting their exploration of what to make in the ocean, where they think, what am I doing here? Oh my god. Or they think, blub, blub, when there is a drop of water getting into their snorkels. Where you feel uncomfortable, where you realize that everything you design has an effect on this very strange ecosystem where you might not even know the, the names of some of the species. I ask us to design our world a little bit more inclusively. Multi-species design is the next layer of inclusive design. Everything we put into this world designs us back, and we are making decisions that affect not just the humans who live in our environments, but everyone who has a right to these places. In a sense, I'm asking how to be a kinder kind of human. Thank you. <laughs>